Um, when I informed my family that I would be up here today, the first thing my brother says is, oh no. <laughs> and throughout the week, he's been reminding me to be conscious of time. <laughs> Which is funny because he talks more than me. <laughs> um, anyway. I have a friend who last night said, we're going to be there with our notebooks marking your sermon. So first and foremost, suit and tie check, Bible check. I think that puts me at about 20% so far. <laughs> right, let's have some church. The theme for today is pain. I was given this topic in June and reluctantly I accepted. But once I accepted, I then thought to myself, what am I going to say? And I asked myself, what can I even say about pain, you know? And I think it was last month I was speaking to my Tutisani. Um, I'm always here being a pulpit manager. And my Tutisani says, I like the way you always tell stories. So I decided today I'll share my stories of pain. Let's start by defining pain. Um, perhaps if we can just have a few synonyms that will help us understand what this four-letter word is. Suffering, agony, affliction, torture, torment, discomfort, soreness, sorrow, Grief, heartache, heartbreak, sadness, unhappiness, distress, and misery. Thank you. Does anyone here resonate with any of those words? Anyone? We've all been there. And there's a reason why we've all been there. And the reason lies in Genesis 3, verse 16 to 17. Reading from the English Standard Version. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I've, I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thank you. Now the first thing I picked up here, you know, everyone always talks, or women always speak of the pain of childbirth. And I guess for centuries, men have always questioned. Ah, they're saying it's painful. And women say, ah, you have no idea. And men say, ah, no, we felt pain. And women say, no. I may be single, but one thing I've learned is never argue with women. If that's what they say, we believe them. It's okay. <laughs> now, the other thing I picked up is Eve was allocated pain, but Adam was also allocated pain. Therefore, both men and women from the beginning of the earth were designated pain. So perhaps a statement we can draw from this is if you haven't felt pain in your life, then you haven't started living. Because God says you shall live in pain. Just a bit of context. When I was younger, most of the people with siblings know this. When you have siblings, you fight a lot. Uh, you argue a lot, and you may even come to fists and pinching and slapping. So my brother and I used to fight a lot. And my father would always get upset when we would fight. So regardless of who won the fight between my brother and I, my father always won the ultimate fight. And so the year is 2002, 20 years ago. I must be old if I can say statements like that. <laughs> the year is 2002. I'm in grade three. Um, it's after school, 
And I think my brother and I had just come from watching a karate movie on TV. So excited by what we saw and all the moves, we decided to try them out ourselves. And so my brother goes first and he succeeds. I go second and I don't know who moved wrongly, whether it was him or me, I don't know. But immediately I drop to the floor and I feel a sharp pain in my arm that I've never felt before. And I remember I'm crying and my brother starts panicking. And it's only this week when I was breaking it down that I realized my brother wasn't panicking that I was hurt. He was panicking because we got, I got hurt through violence, which my father was very much against. So this all happened while my father's at work. And so I think my mom rushed me to the hospital. I fractured my left arm. I get a cast and everything. So now it's evening time. My father's home. And he asks, so what exactly happened? <laughs> so the whole time I hadn't figured or I hadn't thought that when I get home, I'm going to be interviewed about the events that led to me fracturing my arm. So in the heat of the moment, I said, ah, I was running outside and I fell. Then he says, you fell? How do you run and you just fall and break your arm? And I said, ah, no, it was on the concrete. So, you know, I tried to explain it away. I don't know if he believed me. If he did, then I guess today is my confession. <laughs> this is my confession. We were fighting and I fractured my arm. Um, but where I'm going with this, I'm speaking on physical pain. Can we just turn to John 19, verse 1 to 3? Reading from the King James Version. Then, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put it put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. This is Jesus. Jesus going through physical pain, being beaten, being scourged. To be scourged is to be whipped. I don't think there's anyone in here who has ever been scourged. But it's amazing to realize that Christ not only came down for the human experience, but he went through an extraordinary human experience that most humans have never gone through. Most humans have never had a crown of thorns on their head. Most humans have never been whipped. But Christ came and went the extra mile for us. Can we please read Isaiah 53 verse 3? Reading from the NIV, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Now, when I asked who is familiar with pain or the words that are synonymous with pain, I saw a lot of head nodding. Um, I imagine everyone start, started to, to, to picture all the events or the moments where they've been in different kinds of pain. And here we see Jesus not only knew pain, but it says he was familiar familiar with pain, which means he went through it often, Jesus himself. Now, we have people that, when they see other people in pain, when other people are sick, they feel it's necessary to add their two cents, which is fine, it's part of the human condition. But now, when you're sick, whether at home or in hospital, maybe you've had an accident, there are people who start saying it's a punishment. Have you ever heard that? Then people say, ah, it was only a matter of time. They don't have a PhD, but they're putting a timeline on someone else's illness. Imagine. Now, can we please read Isaiah 53 verse 4, the next verse. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. We considered him punished by God. So Jesus himself was considered punished. People said it. He's being crucified as a punishment. 
Aitaurisa. He was too popular. He was taking the glory away from the temple, from the Pharisees. What we get from this, or what we should understand by this, is that pain is a rite of passage in the Christian experience. Pain is a rite of passage in the Christian experience. From the time of Adam and Eve to the time of Jesus himself, humans have been experiencing pain. Now, this brings us to our next type of pain because when people talk, they're expressing their thoughts. And so I'd like to go to a different kind of pain, a pain that we cannot see, a pain that exists within the mind. This is a pain that is all too common with everyone, but mostly these days it's identified by the youth. Have you ever heard of the word depression? Anxiety. These are things that our youth go through today. These are things that even adults go through today, but perhaps they may explain them away because of culture, other factors, which is fine. Um, but I just want to speak on mental pain. When you are weighed down, perhaps with a decision, when you're weighed down, perhaps with an addiction, when you're weighed down, perhaps with depression. The year is 2015. And I find myself in Canada for university. I had been there about a year and a half up till this point. And so I wanted to change the course I was doing at that, at that moment. And so I applied to the school to change my course. The school denies me and says, ah, we can't give you that, but we'll give you this. I applied to two other schools, same decision. We can't give you what you want, but we'll give you this. And so then I sat down with myself and I asked myself, my parents are paying a lot of money for me to be here, but what's the point in staying if I'm studying something that I don't want to? What's the point of the sacrifice? And so I began to struggle with the decision on whether I should stay or whether I should leave. And for, I think it was a good month, I was struggling. I couldn't speak to anyone about it because sometimes we do it to ourselves. Many thoughts start to flood your mind. If I go back home, then what? If I stay, then what? What will people say? What will I do? You know, what does my future look like? And so we're closing in on the beginning of the semester and now there's come a point where I have to make a call. And so I'm praying, I'm praying, but still I'm fighting. I'm fighting with the decision. And so one night, I don't know why, I just broke down. And I stopped crying in the middle of nowhere. I'm by myself, I'm at home. And I just felt like home wasn't the right place. And so it's now 3 a.m. in the morning. And I make, I make my way to the chapel on campus which was, at the time, it was a Catholic chapel. And I'm at the doors of this chapel, and I'm crying. And I just start, I'm not, I'm not praying, but I'm speaking with God. I'm like, God, what do you want me to do? I, I don't know. I don't know what you want from me. You brought me here. Tell me what's next. And I think I stayed there for a good hour. And at some point, there was now silence. I think it's about four in the morning. And there's silence, and I start to hear a voice in my head, and it's just saying, peace be still, peace be still, peace be still. And in that moment, I decided to leave. And I remember telling my parents, and I expected them to say, ah, how can you say you're leaving after all this and so forth? But they were very calm about it, and they said, Okay, if it's what you've decided, then come home. Why I mention my parents is because a lot of parents in the church today don't know how much their children are suffering. There's a saying that says, if you know, you know. Parents, let me tell you, you think you know, but you don't know. You don't know what your kids are going through. You don't know the pains that they are fighting. The youth today are overcome 
with the pain of addiction. There's a saying that says, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Youth today are suffering from addiction to sex, drugs, and alcohol. You might say, not my child, but it could be your child. It most likely is your child. And they are struggling. So parents, my message to you is, help your child through their pain. Do not be ignorant. If you are ignorant, you will lose your child. Help your child through their pain, please. Can we read Matthew 26, verse 38? Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. My soul is overwhelmed. Jesus himself, God himself, was overwhelmed mentally. He was overwhelmed. Jesus went and prayed and he said, Father, if it's possible, take this thing away from me. I don't want it, you know. I'm sure most of you have seen this when you're faced with someone who is addicted to something. I've had interactions with people who are holding a cigarette and they tell you, I don't want this thing. But every time I wake up, I, I can't stop. Their soul is overwhelmed. Here we have members who are overwhelmed with sorrow, whether from home, from work, from relationships. We are in pain. And as a church, we need to start addressing that kind of pain more. I was speaking with Pastor Miri a few weeks ago, and we were discussing just the needs of our youth today and the things that they go through. And we began to speak about um, the pandemic that's rife now, uh, which is drugs in the country. And I said, Pastor, I know a lot of parents will go and say, ah, I've heard there's a specialist in such and such a place. I heard there's a facility that does this, this. But earlier in the year, we had, we had a discussion here at church about dealing with mental health professionals that can help our youth. And one of the things that came up was we have professionals within the church that can help. Professionals when they're outside, that have people rushing to them. But we have access to them here in the church. And Pastor Mbiri said, the problem that we have as a church is that we spend millions of dollars building facilities that are only open one day of the week. Churches are called hospitals, but I've never seen a hospital that has its doors closed six days a week. What are we doing with our facilities six days a week? What are we doing with our campsites for 51 weeks of the year? So I said, Pastor, why don't we then structure something where we can help those who are struggling, not just the youth, because it's not only youth who suffer from mental pain, adults too. We're living in difficult times economically, socially, everyone is struggling. We had camp meeting at Loma Gandhi, and there was a pastor who is also a psychologist. And last week I found out people were flocking to him. He came from South Africa, but during camp, people were flocking to him, young and old, for assistance, for his professional help. And some were willing to then fly to South Africa for follow-ups. But why are we fl flying to South Africa when we have those same professionals here? So I said, Pastor, we need to do better because... We have the patients within the church. We have the professionals within the church. And we have the facilities, the churches themselves. We don't need anything from outside. So we need to be better as a church with addressing and helping out with other people's pain. I move on to the next version of pain. Um, which is something I didn't really have much to speak on until recently. So the year is 2022. Thursday, 21 July. And 
It was almost a movie-like setting. My grandfather was in hospital. And so all through, he was in hospital for two days. So all through, doctors were giving us updates. They call us into a room as a family. This is what we've done. This is what, what's happened. This is how we're helping him. So at 6 p.m., 6 or 7 p.m. on the Thursday night, they call us in and they say, we want to give you guys an update. And so everyone comes in the room. It's been happening for the last few hours, so of course it's just another update. And two, two doctors walk in and they explain, this is what's happened recently in the last few hours, this is what we've done. And very, in movie-like fashion, they say, he crashed again. But unfortunately, we couldn't save him. And immediately, I hear a sharp wailing come from my mother. A sound I've never heard her make before. And everyone starts crying, people are weeping, people are weeping, people, people are lost. And so, in that moment, I think I'm in shock. And so I walk out the room and I stand outside and I can't even cry. No tears are coming, I'm just in shock. And so people, people start to call, people start to text, you know, and then people start to say, ah, but the doctors could have done this, the doctors should have done that. Let's go to John, John 11, 32 to 36. Bro, standard version. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, when Jesus was weeping and the Jews who had come, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Thank you. So the first thing Mary does when she sees Jesus, she questions him. And we find this a lot. For those of you who have lost someone close to you, there's many questions that come up in your mind. What if, shouldn't they have done this? Shouldn't we have done that? What if we hadn't done that? How many times have we questioned God when we lose someone? But what we need to realize that when death comes, it comes because God has allowed it. God doesn't deal with would have, could have, should have. God deals with what is because he is. He says it himself, I am that I am. I am sent you. So we should remember God doesn't deal with possibilities and probabilities. God deals in reality because in an ever-changing world, God is the only constant. So it is not our role to question his will. Job tried it. Job tried to question God and the response he got was scary. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So the next time we find ourselves crossing that line and questioning God, we should ask ourselves, where was I when God was even making this person who I am mourning? So it's now the night before we bury my grandfather. And I think I'd fallen asleep and I woke up around 10 o'clock. And I hear there's some singing. So I walk around the corner and I see one of my uncles singing. And I see my mother singing as well. And it's very low. A lot of people are sleeping around this time. And so throughout the past couple of days, I didn't even know what to say to my own mother. As confident and as articulate as I was speechless. I didn't know what to say to her. So in that moment, I see her singing, and I say, well, 
I don't have words, but the least I can do is sing with her. And so I join in song, and we start singing, and I start singing louder. And more people start to wake up, and they start joining us. And eventually, there's a whole group of us. And that night, we sang until 5 in the morning. And I saw, for the first time in a few days, my mother smile while we sang. So we need to understand that when someone is going through loss, it's not about having the right words, but sometimes it's about being in the right place, which is next to them. We learn from this verse that when Lazarus died, Jesus rushed to be with others. He went to cry with others. He went to mourn with the others. So we should understand that when we are overwhelmed by loss, God is overwhelmed by loss too. He's going through it with us. Can you please read John 11, verse 36 again? Just verse 36. The, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. See how he loved him. Jesus didn't say anything, but his actions showed how much he loved his friend. His friend passed away. He showed up. We have a lot of people in this day and age who are WhatsApp mourners. They'll send you crying emojis, but they won't come and cry with you. It is a biblical principle. It is not culture. It is a biblical principle that when people are in mourning, you go and join them. Recently, two days ago, Queen Elizabeth passed away. Over the next few weeks, we're going to see world leaders flying to London to go and mourn with the family. It is not culture, it is not Zimbabwean culture or human culture. It is a Jesus principle that you rush and you mourn with others. So we have our WhatsApp mourners. They'll send you a message or they'll put up a status. Ah, tete matir wadzisa. Ah, gone too soon. And they'll post the whole photo library, pictures from 11 years ago. But when you say, ah, CC. They'll say, ah, but suddenly my lights are back. Suddenly motor ya ne fuel in automukachet. Just something for my youth. <laughs> um, but the lesson from this is when others are at loss, when others are in pain, when others are in mourning, we do not sit and send text messages. Especially now, COVID is gone. Go and mourn with others. Go and go through pain with others. When you have a relative, a friend who is going through mental pain, who is struggling with addiction, don't just sit and mock them. Don't judge them. Go with them through their pain. When you have a relative in hospital, go visit them. It doesn't help anything to post a status when someone was in the hospital for two months and you couldn't step in that hospital. It doesn't help anyone. Which brings me to my last type of pain. The pain of Njolo. The year is. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a Mjolo experience, guys. <laughs> I know there were plenty of people looking forward to that one. But the common denominator in everything I've outlined from start to finish is this. God is going through our pain with us. He doesn't watch you. He doesn't wait for you. He brings you through your pain. And this is emphasized by my last verse, which is Daniel chapter 3, verse 24 to 25. Daniel chapter 3, verse 24 to 25 in, in the ESV version, please. Be not cause three men bound.
I'll just read it out. Um, I think there's something going on with that microphone. It says, Daniel chapter 3, verse 24 to 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into that fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. God is walking with us through the fires of pain that we are cast into, bound. But when he gets into it with us, we are unbound and we walk through the fire. Jesus is there to go with us through it all. Whether it's physical pain, whether it's mental pain, whether it's the pain of loss, the pain of heartbreak, God is there going with us through it all. way to Egypt after being sold by his own flesh and blood. When Naomi lost her husband and two sons. When Hannah was tormented for being barren. When Job went from rolling in riches to rolling in dust. When Stephen was stoned rock by rock. When Jesus himself was nailed to the cross. God was there through it all. When you lost your father, when you lost your husband, when you lost your child, when you lost your job, when that man told you he doesn't want you anymore, when that girl broke your heart, God was there through it all. Let us pray, ladies and gentlemen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for going through our pain with us. We thank you for going through the fire with us. We thank you for not showing us how we will live, but for living it with us. Father, we have plenty here today who came in so much pain who are weary Lord who are tired of the burdens that they carry who are hurt by the very people that they love you know our pain Lord you know our pain individually so Father at this point in time we ask that you might comfort us and that you might bring us through our pain with you. Bring us through the rite of passage. Bring us through the Christian experience. We have some today who have healed from their pain. They no longer have wounds, but they are now scars. But we know, Father, just like you, we are all too familiar with pain. It will return. But when it does, Father, our only prayer is that you say, peace, peace, be still to the storms within our soul and that you go through it all with us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who was nailed on the cross for our sin, I pray, amen.
have learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. And I've been to lots of places, and I've seen a lot of faces. Jesus let me know I was his own Through it all Through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God Through it all Thank him for all the storms he's brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I never know that he could solve them. I never knew what my faith in God could do. in God through it all through it all I've learned to depend upon his word I've learned to depend upon his word I've learned to depend upon his word